Are you building an AI? I've already built one. And over the next few days, you're going to be the human component in the Turing test. Holy shit. Yeah, that's right, Caleb. You are dead center of the greatest scientific event in the history of man. If you've created a conscious machine, it's not the history of man. That's the history of gods. Hey, yo. What's going on, my friends? Welcome back to a big one. Episode 20 of our ridiculously numbered system. Of in madness pod it's Sean the Butcher. I'm here with Vertebrae 33. What's going on? What's happening, Sean? How are you? 20, 20 episodes. It's really 204 episodes, but we know we number them in such a ridiculous way that <laughs> we so are all confused. yeah, we are joined by a very special guest. Finally, I've been waiting for this moment for a while. Andrew Herman, vocalist of Johnny Booth. What up? Hello, thanks for having me, guys. Explain well, this numbering system. What's uh what's so on? we what so we were we had a steady numbering system. And then when I when I moved into my new house, there were like delays and stuff. And I'm like, there's no way we could do a whole new movie. But there is a way we could do like a mini episode talking about stuff that's not movie related. So we called it the point five, because instead of going from like episode 12 to episode 13, we called it episode 12.5. Once we did that immediately, we were like, we need to do more of these. So now we've been doing point fives for every episode <laughs> and also splitting every episode in two. So one ep episode is actually three episodes and that's been for the last like 10 episodes right. so realistically yeah this is like <laughs> it's so good yeah there's a lot of math and we're hitting into a scientific film so that that's i perfect. love that but it's our 20th film so that's yes. easy that's easy to remember I get and that. there is a 0.75 episode in there that was a comic-con special just to yeah. blow everybody's mind i like yeah, we, a little special yeah. Yeah, we went super crazy with it. Um, we are on the socials at in madness pod, in madness pod at gmail.com. So you can hit us in the mail sack. We will be mm. reading the emails on our next point five. Me and Vertebrae have discussed. I'm excited for that. Uh, reading our emails blindly. So if they are terrible reviews, then we just read them anyway. We're also on the socials, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, threads in madness at uh in mad at in madness pod in madness pod at gmail.com we are on youtube as well in madness pod make sure you subscribe make sure you like make sure you comment make sure you tell your friends uh in madness monday new episode drops every single monday so happy monday in madness monday if you're listening and uh before we get started vertebrae do you have the soundtrack for this movie on vinyl I do. I have it. It's it's behind me too. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey. It's, yeah, it's a really good soundtrack. So uh, before we get into it, though, I want to okay. hit the plugs from our man Andrew Herman, vocalist Johnny Booth, just announced the tour. Yeah, yeah, we're going on tour with uh, Silent Planet, Thornhill, and Aviana. Um, I'm super stoked about it. It's definitely the the longest tour we've done so far, and um, I'm just I'm just really pumped that Silent Planet asked to have us so it's it's going to be fun going to be yes. all over the place full sure us you, so we're out yes here. make sure you check out this tour also make sure you pick up the new album moments elsewhere one of yeah. my tops of the year and i'm sure many others and you can hear songs off that on the in madness playlist which we have been formulating on spotify dude after our last episode when we added whitney houston let me tell you this mm -hmm. is one of the greatest playlists in history can i just randomly i'm just going to go to it and put on a song and watch let's see what fire comes up hopefully it's not disappointing ready ready randomly in madness playlist what do we got uh -huh. oh come on ready vertebrae knows this one give it a second it's a slow starter. Yeah, I can't hear it. It's coming. Be patient. Oh, you got to be able to hear this. Maybe I'll pipe it in. <laughs> Edit it in later on. <sighs> Something. It's, uh, yeah, it's from The Mist. It's, <laughs> ah, the, it's the that's depressing a great song. Movie. I can yeah. talk about yeah. that movie, too. Yeah, we, we, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. That I would have known. That part I would have known. But Sean, it sounds like you are in the mist playing this right now. Dude, this, You're the, in the in madness, the in madness play is, playlist on Spotify. It is fire. It is very good. Put it on random. You got so far two hours of music on this. So oh, uh, we're just building it and building it. And it's all involving 
songs that have clips from movies that we talk about on this podcast well, this or when, when a, yeah when a song has a sample from a movie we talk about in the song dillinger escape plan sampled seven so we have the dillinger escape plan song with the seven sample for our seventh episode when we did seven so here we are i'm gonna shut up five minutes in episode 20 a big one our guest andrew herman from johnny booth vertebrae what movie are we doing ah uh. This was on my list from the beginning when we first talked about doing a podcast, and it's Ex Machina, directed and written by Alex Garland. Uh, you'll know Alex Garland from 28 Days Later, Annihilation, uh, Men, which I haven't seen yet, which I need to see, and Devs, which is one of the best sci-fi series of all time. And I don't like the rank thing, Sean, you know, but it, it, uh, it's... Yeah up there it's it up makes there. sense with annihilation actually now that i didn't realize he did that movie yes we'll we'll get into it but there's a few and, things they focus on this movie and that movie that are identical okay yes and 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 i love annihilation as well and it's i believe it's the same composers for the soundtrack too so it makes sense um, it all makes sense released in the u.s in april 2015 i think it came out overseas 2014 uh, by uh, A24, A24, so Lighthouse, Witch, Midsommar, Hereditary, Under the Skin, Green Knight. So we're very familiar with them on this podcast, Sean. Uh, soundtrack by Ben Salisbury and Jeff Barrow. They did the Annihilation soundtrack as well. And Devs, and they worked on Archive 81, which is like a sci-fi horror series as well. So um, I think it's easy to say, we'll get through this quickly, but the mo movie title reference is... Deus Ex Machina, which is Latin for God from the Machine. Um, and we're going to get a lot of religious overtones in this entire film uh, all over the place. Pro probably we could spend just a podcast talking about the religious overtones of this film and then a separate one about the technology and everything else. Um, and I think, Sean, I'm going to say that this movie has like your kind of perfect ending. We, we, we jump all around. We're not going to say the ending yet, but I can tell. I know Sean well enough to know. Was I, I'll say, like, so th again, like, and I'll quickly, uh, this was one that I've seen during the pandemic, but was half watching and didn't know it, I was seeing it. So now dipping into it for the podcast, like every sentence dipping into it. And boy, was I cackling my ass off in those last 45 <laughs> seconds. But we'll get to it. We'll it's get perfect. to it. So uh, the cast is uh, Domhnall Gleeson as Caleb Smith, programmer at Blue Book. Oscar Isaac as Nathan Bateman, the CEO of Blue Book. Alicia Vikander. We're going to mess up all the names. Uh, we always do. What what should we call you? Should we call you Andrew or Herman or both? Uh, Her Herman, Herman is fine. My friends call me Herman. So you okay. guys will be my friend. Right. We're officially friends. This He's is like great. James Bond. Bond. See, Sean, Bond. I told you you'd never have to leave your house. I made a new friend that I don't even have to leave. You see how that My works? My friends call me Bond. <laughs> uh, as Ava, and she does a tremendous job. And Sonoya Mizuno as Kyoko. Kyoko. Um, and there's always a Star Wars connection, <laughs> Sean, on this You always podcast. make it. You always and, find it. And this is, but this is an easy one because okay. this, this movie comes out in April 2015. December 2015, Star Wars The Force Awakens comes out, and uh, Gleason is General Hux, who I've quoted on this podcast before, and Oscar Isaac is uh, famously Poe Dameron. So they face off and butt heads in in the new Star Wars trilogy as well. So, um, And I'll just say that th this movie you know, is considered like hard sci-fi, so people like to categorize things, but that's more based off of a lot of scientific theories. And it was influenced by a book, uh, Murray Shanahan's Embodiment and the Inner Life, Cognition and Consciousness in the Space of Possible Minds. That is one hell of a title. Good God. Sick. I yeah. like long yeah. cuts. And the, um, the book argues that cognition revolves around a process of inner rehearsal um, by an embodied entity working to predict the consequences of its physical actions. Um, and they loved the book so much, they brought Murray on as a consultant on the film, uh, along with a British uh, scientist as well, were consultants. So this this plays very close to the vest on a lot of pioneering scientific 
principles that are going on right now. And when I say right now, the movie's 2015, but when you watch it now, to me, it doesn't feel dated at all. Like this doesn't feel eight years old. Not there there was a lot of Terminator. We did two episodes of Terminator. And as I was watching this, I'm like, it's happening again. It's happening again. Especially with the SAG strike just ending. Because mm -hmm. uh, they were going on strike a lot about the AI stuff. It's, it's definitely Yeah, I think it's cool. more relevant maybe now than it was when it came out. Maybe it's a little bit ahead of its time in that way. Um, and there's a bunch of scientific stuff that's referenced. And we'll go through it. I'll miss things and I'll make mistakes, Sean, because... Newsflash, I'm not a scientist. Uh, but science is facts. Not yet. Scientist, not yet. Don't Although I started that. reading this Murray Shanahan's book because, uh, you know, that's what I do, Sean, when I get into these movies. And it was a lot. I was, that was not a cat. It's not a casual read. It's very entertaining and knowledgeable, but it's not. Um, you can't just pick it up and casually read it. So no, no, not, not much, very entertaining. And this does not have the science of Lucy, the movie you love so much. Sean. Man, <laughs> man, Herman, did you see Lucy? I don't think so. Ah, man, watch it and let me know if it sucks or not. Because I, I loved it. And boy, when we put out that episode, you want to talk about an atomic bomb going off. <laughs> Just no one, no one the, was at the the stinker of the year. Apparently, <laughs> I still love it. I still love it. You can't go wrong. Scarlett Johansson is a superhero. But I but, enjoyed it. It's just yeah. it was it was easy to Dur during the duration of the episode. Vertebrae smashed every single fact in it that I thought was possibly true. He was like, "No, no, it's absolutely wrong. not. You're thinking yeah. too hard. It's much yeah. dumber than that." <laughs> <laughs> so you do these deep dives in these movies, and you're like, "Oh, this must mean something." Sometimes it's just stupid, and that's okay. Yeah. It yeah yeah we we did that when we did the halloween episode because there's so much you can get into with halloween and then if you talk to john carpenter he's like no we only did that because we needed to get the shot done or <laughs> you know so you ready to go sean shall we get into it episode 20 a big one for us in madness pod with andrew herman johnny booth cheers cheers fellas cheers uh, and before we start, uh, really quick, I don't know if it's this one or not, but uh, I'm gonna, I want to start getting in the habit of asking all of our guests, Andrew Herman from Johnny Booth, what's your favorite scary movie? What's my favorite scary movie? Um, I mean, I, I got to go with the classic. It's The Shining. Good. Okay. It's a nice. correct answer, I think. Perfect. It's so, yeah. it's pretty much perfect. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I want to ask all of our guests that we can yeah. make a little montage. I think that'd be pretty sweet. Let's do it. Episode 20. Here we are. Very debatable. Are we doing ex machina? Ex machina? Ex mahina? What, what is there an official? Because I've heard it said every different way. Uh, I say ex machina, but I mean, you know, I could be wrong, but I Herman, how, how have you said it? Machina. Machina. That I mean, that's how I've always uh, heard it said, and how I've always said it. But we're doing it. Machina. Vertebra <laughs> Vertebrae has been singing the praises about this movie since we started this podcast. And uh, Herman, you texted me, and I was like, "What movies you want to do?" And this movie was on your list, and I'm like, "Damn, I've I've been outnumbered." I was like, "Let's finally do it." Vertebrae was very happy. <laughs> They were able to uh, do this. I saw this movie once, like I mentioned, probably during the pandemic, did not deep dive. Mm -hmm. uh, now I am about to step very deep into this. These are my notes as they're happening and as my mind is is <laughs> Wait, flexing. You write them as the I write. <laughs> yes, I'll pause the movie and I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck is going on? These are your unfiltered thoughts. These are my unfiltered <laughs> thoughts as they happen. Strap in. Let's go. This is episode 20 X Machina. The movie starts. Bunch of jabronis sitting in an office, just like me, just like many of us. Dude gets an email, VIP email, staff lottery. He won first prize, picks up his phone. We see this image from his phone, kind of like predator vision. And it looks like it's looking at him as if it's watching him. Yep. He text, texts his buddy, I won. We see his camera on his laptop, also seems like it's watching him. Bunch of people start texting him, congrats. His coworkers run up, congratulating him as well. And we cut to this beautiful snow covered mountaintop. It looks like Alaska. I don't know where the hell it is. We can, we could get into that. We could get into it uh, in a few minutes, but okay. uh, it's I will say that. Yeah. Okay. Norway, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Sean, Sean was like, I have no idea where it is. No, hell no. I thought it was Alaska. Honestly, <laughs> you can stay and, there. It's a real place. 
Yes, it is. It's a hotel. It's uh, I have it in my notes. It's it was designed by a minimalist uh, designer, and it's in and it's in Norway. But they filmed in two locations, so they kind of pe- but they were both done by the same designer, so they work together. But like part of it is actually another place. Um, but they kind of feed it seamlessly, and the landscape is amazingly beautiful. Um, the helicopter over the ice gives you a little bit of thing vibes right off the bat. Uh, it so also gave me a big Jurassic bit. Park vibes. Yes. When they're yes. flying we're, into Jurassic uh, Park. We're headed to an adventure, and a key part of this is the is the nature part. Although it's called Ex Machina, we get all this flashes of nature, and we'll go through it. We go through the movie. So just a beautiful shot. Our winner's flying a helicopter. Asked the pilot, how long till we get to the estate? <laughs> We've been flying over it for two hours, you filthy rich bastard. We see this beautiful land, waterfalls, vast forest area. Like I have here in my nose, looks like Jurassic Park. The chopper lands, massive field. The kid's like, you're leaving me here? This is the closest I'm allowed to get. Follow the river. The chopper takes off. The man follows the river, dragging all of his shit. All of his uh, belongings. He's got no service on his phone. He's a massive satellite dish. He walks over to what I guess is this rich guy's house. Right, Sean. So if I'll say the first kind of religious reference we get is the follow the river. <sighs> right right there. We get that already. The river of life and revelation representing God's God life-giving damn. presence. So they get they hit us with it immediately. Follow the river. Lots of ancient civilizations built themselves around rivers that represented life besides the sun to people so right away we get that immediately out garland is not messing with us there <laughs> everything in this movie matters every For single sure. note in this even film. the the i think it's one of the first song that comes on when he's he's like listening to an electronic song mm-hmm. in the beginning uh it's yep. called enola gay which is the the name of the plane that dropped the atomic dropped the bomb, bomb. Yeah. yeah yes and there's a lot of those atomic bomb uh, yes. references in, uh, throughout the movie too yes he, yeah he did a lot of homework for this movie and if you've seen any interviews with alex garland you can tell like just listening to him talk about it he's so deep into these films and the proper research to get to what he needs this is some robert it, eggers shit yeah he can't help himself it was it's instantly are we getting references from him the doorbell says caleb smith please approach face the screen caleb approaches looks at the screen which sort of has like the red dot like hal in uh 2001 space Odyssey. Yep. there is a heavy 2001 space Odyssey vibe in this <laughs> i picked up on it yeah <laughs> score one for sean <laughs> yeah if you if you would have said a different movie we could have done a sean fax drop where you not yet completely we, wrong <laughs> they're coming up soon <laughs> It takes a pick of Caleb, prints him out a key guard, but of course, of course, his face is squinting when it takes the pick, so his key card looks like he's an idiot on it. He enters, the door closes creepily behind him. He's walking through this massive house, glass, stone, peaceful music playing, screaming, hello? No one's answering. He goes upstairs, ends up in a room with a glass wall overlooking this beautiful river. There's a man hitting a punching bag outside. I'm assuming he's the filthy rich owner of this insanely beautiful property. Hmm. Now, I'm not going to lie. At first, I thought this was the kid who plays Wednesday Adams' little boyfriend at summer camp in Adams Family Values. Uh, but that was just Sean Fax. Sean Fax. Oh. It is not him. He yeah. just happens to look exactly like the kid. It's his doppelganger, I think. However, interestingly enough, this dude in this movie does the voice of Gomez Adams in the animated Adams Family. Oscar so, Isaac does the voice of Gomez Adams? Yeah, for the new animated uh, series oh. or the new whatever animated. I, that I, I checked the IMDb, at least I hope so. But that might be Sean Facts too, but whatever. I was wrong, but I think I was technically right. He is involved in the Adams family somehow. <laughs> he knows a guy named Adam and he has a <laughs> and he has a family. I love it. The man approaches. He says, Caleb Smith, dude, looking forward to this week with you. Brings Caleb in the house, offers some food, some drink. Caleb is all right. Rich dude can't eat. He's hung over. He went heavy last night. He has to compensate with exercise, antioxidants. Caleb's like, was it a good party? What party? There was no party. He was I'm drinking alone. Like- <laughs> yeah, the life of a poor, rich, filthy, rich bastard. Drinking and he, alone. And, and you know, this character, uh, Isaac, 
kind of was inspired by two two different people, and he states it's Bobby Fischer, uh, who was a world renowned chess player, and Stanley Kubrick. So we already talked about the Shining film, and now we get the, the Stanley Kubrick right here. Um, so he kind of saw both of them as these elusive and mysterious uh, geniuses, and I think he he plays into that a lot in this film. I'll, I'll also say that. When you come into the house with all that glass and you're sort of in the earth, but not in the earth. And there's this modern, you know, technology kind of jutting out of the planet. It, it, it just we that just weaves us into this whole story on what is, you know, th that feeds us to what is humanity and what isn't and consciousness and what part do we play on this planet and technology and nature and it's an amazing location. I don't know that I would ever stay there, but it's amazing. Location. Yeah, I'm saying you walk in this house. I what are you thinking, have. Herman? I honestly, I I mean, I'm a designer, so I'm gonna be super stoked about it right it's off like the bat. I'm like, oh, look at that. I like I like modernism, minimalism mixed with gothic or you know, natural textures. I really, really love that idea. So this is right up my alley anyway, you know, like the the vibe is my thing. Also, I will say at this point in the movie, the manipulation starts for Caleb instantly like yeah because that, that that's also a big part of this movie is, is just manipulation but he immediately starts manipulating him because he's like bro I'm so happy to see you like the way he approaches him he's extremely calculated through the entire movie the way that he interacts with him and you yeah. we'll talk about it as we get through it but he's very deliberate in how he directs his language through the entire movie Right Absolutely. now, and yeah, this is ahead, his right second. Right. This is his second manipulation, right? His first is the email, and we find out later on. But now he's actually manipulating him in person, and yes, he is. Dare I say, robotic in his hey. skill level, skill level of manipulation with with him. He he's done his research on him as well, or people like him and knows how to get what he needs. Mm -hmm. So he cuts right to the chase. He's like, I know you're freaked out by the chopper, the mountain, the house, meeting me, having this conversation right here. He understands the moment Caleb is having. Can we just get past it? Can we be two guys, me and you, Nathan and Caleb? Here are our main characters. He doesn't want to do the whole employer employee thing. Caleb agrees. He says, it's good to meet you. The men shake hands. He explains this to Caleb about his key card. It opens some doors. It doesn't open others. The card keeps him within his limits. He goes, try this one. Caleb puts up his pass. It turns blue. And he goes, I guess, I guess this one's for you, Caleb. He opens the door, this beautiful little room. However, a little claustrophobic. Nathan notices Caleb's expression. Something's wrong. What's wrong? The windows lack thereof. There's a reason there's no windows in this room. This building isn't a house. It's a research facility. Buried in these walls is enough fiber optic cable to reach the moon and lasso it. I want to talk to you and share with you about what I'm researching. I want to share it so much. It's eating me up inside, but there's something I need you to do for me first. And here come the NDAs, non-disclosure <laughs> agreement. In I love terms. those. I've signed a few. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thankfully, I haven't had to sign any yet. I'm sure I will eventually. Not after this episode. Hey. <laughs> Are you staying in that room? Harmony, you staying in that room? staying in here like forever yeah. no but like in that in that <laughs> space yeah forever well forever yeah good <laughs> good illusion to later on but <laughs> but uh I, I don't know i mean i guess it's kind of like a ship in some ways like if you go on if you were on a cruise ship and you didn't have one of the rooms of the balcony or something you have a, but you would at least have a portal but there then there's rooms at the bottom that don't have any windows at all yeah yeah i i think i would i mean i would i would chill in that room i'm not gonna lie after watching this movie uh i immediately looked up this hotel <laughs> i'm gonna be in europe next year i'm like on maybe we should go there for like a well, few okay. days so i may Send actually stay things. there i will let you guys know but Sick. there's a good chance that i end up staying at this place because of this episode because i was so interested um wow and like again I, awesome. I just the design i'm a nerd when it comes to that and we talked about the artwork too but um i'm I'm a nerd when it comes to that stuff, so I'm I'm interested. And Caleb, my and go ahead. I was going to say we don't we didn't show prep that much before on here, but but you know my background is I am an artist, professional artist. So 
we can nerd out on this <laughs> art stuff throughout it. But Sick. awesome. Caleb is reading the contract. The signee agrees to regular data audit, unlimited access to confirm that no disclosure of info has taken place, public or private, using any mean of communication, including but not limited to orally or written electronically. Caleb's like, I need a lawyer. Nathan's like, it's standard. Caleb's like, no, it's not. Nathan's like, no, it's not standard. You don't have to sign it. You can spend the next few days shooting pool, getting drunk, bonding. When you discover what you missed out on in about a year, you'll regret it the rest of your life. That's some Matrix shit right there. Boom. Yeah, red pill, blue pill. <laughs> just, he just red pill, blue pilled him. And you know <laughs> just take the other pill. Just drink all weekend. It's fine. You don't, you don't need to do this. <laughs> Caleb signs the contract. Nathan says, do you know what the Turing test is? And he does. It's, a hu it's when a human interacts with a computer. And if the human doesn't know they're interacting with the computer, the test is passed. What does a pass tell us? That the computer has artificial intelligence. Yeah. Uh -oh. A highly debated topic here on In Madness Pod. Yeah, a few <laughs> times. And the Turing test, Alan Turing developed it in 1950. He didn't call it the Turing test because that would be super arrogant if he did. But he called it the uh, imitation game. Um, and... It, you know, so we're we, we get real science. Unlike Lucy, Sean, we're getting real. We're getting real science. <laughs> God damn real. it! And God damn it! Didn't, uh, Google's AI pass the Turing test recently? Did it really? Oh, no. Yeah, so this is my understanding. This may be a, a Herman fact, <laughs> <laughs> but I, when I was researching stuff for this, um, that Google's AI, it was all through chat, convinced another convince a google employee that it was talking to a person oh, that's fucked up but i don't know the rest of the details behind it but yeah i think Oof. this happened like really recently Oof. it's the beginning this is how it starts yeah when we get like 15 episodes in sean's just gonna replace me with an ai it's just yeah. easier to have them but oh, what's he doing he does facts i could just get him to read whatever he googled am i <laughs> am i ai right now Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, no, man. no. Oh, God, I'm bleeding. No. I'm bleeding. No. Am I real? Caleb asked Nathan if he's building AI. I've already built one. Over the next few days, you're going to be the human component in the Turing test. Holy shit, Caleb says. So now I'm getting flashbacks of a controversial movie here on In Madness Pod called Lucy, where there's this great scene in the beginning of Lucy being set up to make the deal, and it's intertwined with uh, leopard hunting and killing antelope. And I can't help but be reminded of that exact scene for what's happening right now. Don't paint this episode with that. Everyone's going to No be way. <laughs> Lucy's, I'm telling you, check out the movie and then check out our episode about You're restarting it. the controversy. <laughs> this is great. We, we have a guest on. He hasn't seen a movie, and we're going to talk about that movie instead of the one that I'm he did. I'm saying it just reminded me of <laughs> the, the, mouse, no liked. <laughs> the mouse and the cheese scene. Nathan right. tells him if the test is passed, you're in the center of the greatest scientific event in the history of man caleb says if you created a conscious machine it's not the history of man it's the history of gods mm -hmm. then it flashes on the screen ava session one we see a wall covered in a billion post-it notes just like my office we see computer monitors nathan is watching caleb on them taking notes caleb is walking around the house looking at glass walls notices a giant crack in one of the glass walls like somebody punched it that's weird and Sean, um, yep. didn't mean to cut you off, but I was going to say, ahead. as we get through this movie and much like Herman's room that he's in right now and he gets to change colors, uh, <laughs> you're going to notice strong color changes throughout this film, a heavy dose of RGB color scheme um, kind of relating to computer monitors in a lot of ways. There's other colors in it, obviously, but um, there's just strong doses of that throughout it. And there's numerous articles that we'll put in the show notes about kind of color theory and in relation to the way Garland filmed this and the emotions that go along with what colors he's using down to what outfits they're wearing throughout the film and what they represent. And I didn't, since we're having a guest, I didn't want to go, you know, have all of that info on there, but uh, we'll link it in the show notes um, because there's quite a few really interesting articles about, and, and I'm really into color theory too, and emotionally how you respond to colors and 
Uh, Garland plays with it here, and there'll be quick shifts between color throughout. So I just wanted to kind of get that in at the beginning as we go along. And they they also they mirror a lot of what um is going on with her too. They tend to mm-hmm. shift really quickly with her personality. Yes, absolutely. Her artificial intelligence. Through the glass, we see her, the robot. She walks and sees Caleb, continues walking. Stunned, Caleb follows. She turns a corner. We're introduced to Ava, the robot. Most of her insides are gears. They're all showing. The only thing solid is her face, the face of a human. She's sort of this casing around her private bits. Her and Caleb introduce themselves to each other. She's never met anyone besides Nathan before, and she doesn't seem stoked about it. Caleb says they're in a similar position because he's never met anyone like her before. Caleb wants to break the ice and ask Ava if she knows what that means. Overcome initial social awkwardness. Thank you. She replies. So they have a conversation. Ava says she is one. Caleb asks one what? One year or one day? And she just goes, I am one. Caleb is puzzled. He asks when she learned to speak. She says she's always known how to speak, which is strange. Language is something people acquire. Caleb disagrees. It says language is acquired at birth. What's learned is how to string together sentences. And then we see Nathan taking down notes and posting it on his massive post-it note wall. Ava asks if Caleb will be back tomorrow. He agrees. Cut to Caleb and Nathan having a little chat. Caleb is blown away by Ava, says talking to her is like being through the looking glass. And Caleb says he has a way with words. Yeah. Nathan says Caleb has a way with words. And there'll be more. We can talk later. I have quite a few bits about some of these references, like the through the looking glass reference to. Um, but I'm going to give you a quick aside, Herman, because we jump around on these all, all over yeah. the place. So he's he won this con one this in air quotes this contest um to go there and how how long is he supposed to be there for a week seven days wait a minute hang on hang on hang on just, hang on hang on so there's a running theme of this podcast <laughs> from the movie seven okay and, well i love that and movie we, and we get religious and we find you find it in a lot of stuff so he's there He's going to be there seven days, Sean. No way. Hang on. I can't prepare by he He does this all the time, Herman. He intertwines <laughs> everything. Oh, with, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's in crazy. a lot of things. And I mean, I, it's very prevalent specifically in this movie. Right. And and so and then we we go through our sins. Pride, greed, oh, no. wrath, oh, no. envy, lust, oh, gluttony, no. sloth. Oh, no. um, it's interesting. If you look at it through that lens, you will start to pick up on, on a lot of that. That's another layer that this film has to it. There is the through the looking glass quote too, which is an Allison. Uh, I was going to say Allison chains, <laughs> Allison, ah. nice. Allison wonderland um, reference. Um, right. And that's, that's a theme too, with the numbers and everything as well. Um that alludes to the end again the manipulation hard here mm. right especially now uh what are you gonna say something for everybody i was gonna say that uh if we think of it in reference to alice in wonderland um we could talk about when we get to the end but possibly caleb and nathan are a little tweedledee and tweedledum in this in this scenario but we can we'll get to some of that later but Nathan says he wrote down what the uh, other quote that Caleb said the other day about how Nathan created a machine, so he's God. Caleb is struck by that. That's not exactly what I was saying. Nathan cuts him off. Fuck, that was a good quote. I asked Caleb what he thought, and he said, you're not a man, you're a God. But again, Caleb was like, that's not what I said. This is already getting very weird. Nathan gets up, grabs another, what is it, beer, spring water, rich guy drink of some sort. Yeah, they're drinking. He's drinking the whole time. Yeah, they're they're drinking these beers. Uh, and if you notice, at one point there's a beer label, and it says Kikaku, I think, um, which means plan in Japanese. Mm. It's a fake beer Mm. uh, that's in the movie. So again, Garland's not giving us. He's giving us every single thing we need. So he's telling us there's a plan, and it's just amazing when you start to dig into this movie. And he says it right here about him being a god, which is, you know, he's a uh, reference of that. Like, he's basically a very old kind of god throughout the movie. Mm-hmm. 
and he's just opening these bottles and letting the caps and you can hear him just clanging on the floor and he's not picking them up because he's filthy stinking rich why would he he asked caleb if he's impressed he says yes uh then goes although nathan seems to immediately get offended there's a qualification to you being impressed caleb's like no there's a no qualification to her but in a turing test the machine should be hidden from the examiner nathan's like we're past that if i hid ava from you so you just heard her she would pass for human the real test is to show you she's a robot and see if you still feel she has consciousness Caleb agrees. Nathan modestly laughs because, of course, Caleb agrees. Of course, Nathan is right. Caleb asks if her language system is stochastic, non-deterministic. I don't know what these words mean. I'm stupid. I, I can help you, Sean. You Go ahead. Me? Stochastic is randomly determined, having random probability um, or pattern. Non-deterministic is uh, like an algorithm for computer programming. Um, and it means that even if you have the same input, something can exhibit like different behaviors uh, as opposed to deterministic algorithm. And this is where somebody who knows this stuff really well could just rip me apart. But that's kind of the difference. And he he mentions too, like, uh, uh, I think it's like internal semantic tree, like tree structure or something like that too. The, that That's kind of like getting into sentence structure. So all of this is just about how she's able to respond so naturally and what is the formula to get her to respond so naturally to people. Did okay. I get it, Herman? Did I get that okay? I, yeah. <laughs> okay. Cause, I think this yeah. is fun. Caleb goes into all this brilliant, nerdy semantics about how he thought Ava was forming words and sentences. Nathan stops him. I understand you want me to explain how Ava works. I'm not going to do that. Caleb's like, try me. I'm great. He's like, it's not because I think you're too dumb. It's because I want to have a beer and a conversation and not a seminar. Caleb apologizes. And Nathan says, how do you feel about her? Caleb says, I feel that she's fucking amazing. The boys cheers. That's another part of that manipulation. Because, you know, he shifts... He's a very smart man and he's he understands how all these things work. But he's anytime that he tries to talk about um, science or like the the nitty gritty of anything, he always pushes Caleb mm. to think with his feelings, mm. which is very manipulative. Yeah, because he only has them there for his emotions in, exactly. in a lot of ways. And he doesn't want him to get focused on that other stuff. Because he is trying to manipulate him um, in a pretty fucked up way, honestly. But that, I guess that's just the movie. <laughs> yeah, and and then poor poor Caleb, right? He's he's had a rough life, and he worked really hard, and and he gets good at what he does, and thinks that he's being picked for that reason, and thinks he's and he's really just being thrust into, in a lot of ways, a no win situation for him. He he he's has to know kind of it's not going to end good for caleb in a lot of ways he's Maybe a he sucker like the rest of us yeah pretty much i mean he's yeah. here to be manipulated by one, <laughs> by one thing or another basically that's that's his entire role we're yeah. all taking this trip we're all, we're all taking the helicopter even vertebrae i think vertebrae jump on the helicopter i mean listen it'd be like just somebody's like hey i really like your drawings can you tell me more about them <laughs> you want to come oh, to wow. jurassic you, park you yeah. show some interest to me okay cool yeah that'd be great he's fucking in the helicopter like i'm gonna puke i'd be on that <laughs> helicopter but i would just drink the whole weekend <laughs> Yeah. We've got to Caleb unpacking his shit in his room. He's walking around with no shirt on. It looks like his back is a bunch of long scars on it. I don't know what it is. We cut to Caleb in bed. It's 2.30 a.m. Can't sleep. Of course he can't sleep. Dude's got no weed, no melatonin, no white noise machine, no earplugs. He can't spank because he's in this millionaire's house and there's cameras everywhere. How the hell is he supposed to go to sleep? This dude's rich. He's got to have some of this shit somewhere in the house. You don't think Caleb he's just turns tired from the flight? <laughs> he can't no. just be tired if, from no, the flight No, show? no, no. No you way. Have a lot of requirements. You sleep in that room with like... You can't... Yeah. Yes, I do. You have no idea. I sleep like a diva. <laughs> you gotta have... You gotta have the white noise machine and the melatonin and sometimes an extra strength, Tyler. I need to... I need to knock myself the... <laughs> 
out to go to sleep. And then system. even then I sleep for four hours. Yeah, it's terrible. It's terrible. I'm Herman, old what about hell. you? This is my system. Me? Yeah, you have, yeah, dude, you have a sleep, sleep system? Dude, I could sleep through a nuclear bomb. I don't give a shit. See, that's that touring shit. Yeah. That's that sleep in a fucking yeah. back of a van shit. I can't. You gotta do. What you I gotta yeah, you gotta do. What nah. you gotta do. No, yeah. I, I could. I don't need it. I don't really need much to be honest. I'm. I'm pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah. Bray, you. I could sleep at any time, anywhere, at the drop I, of a hat. On my, planes too. My only quality that would make me a good soldier is that I could sleep at any time. Everything else, I'm weak. I couldn't do it. So but you I guys could sleep can sleep anywhere at any time. I slept you... so much as a child that they took me to the doctor and were like, is there something wrong with this little kid? Like, why is he, why is he sleeping so much? He's but, too you know. good. <laughs> yeah, sleep is good. You guys sleep on planes? Absolutely. I can. Yeah, I did. Oh, I, I will did throw week. up in anger. Ugh. No, I'm I wish. sorry for you, man. I we, wish. No, after this wait, world, Sean, get let's something. get real local. Long Island Railroad. You don't sleep on the Long Island Railroad. Are you kidding me? And wake up in some godforsaken spot a thousand miles away from where I need to be? No, I don't what? know. Sleep it's on only the going railroad? to one place. <laughs> no way. No the lure is going to one place. No, well, now, no. too. Right. No. It doesn't just oh, go to man. Penn anymore. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could make that mistake at least. But uh, I lived in Long Beach for a little while. And Sean and I would be. I had to work early and I would be asleep before the train pulled out of the station in Long Beach. I'd just yeah. see the same guy and he would say good morning and know I have my pass and then I'm out yeah. like a light until no some and sometimes he'd have to like shake my shoulder when we got to bed and be like, Yeah, we gotta get up. I'm like, okay, You're cool. Trooling on yourself and shit. Oh, yeah, ah, yeah. Nah. I'm sure I look like a mess, but I'm I'm getting some sleep. No, I cannot. I cannot unless I am on like one hour of sleep. Can I not knock out like that? It's terrible. We'll get you a metronome. You could go to sleep. To the yeah, like friggin' metronome. like Somerset. That's why he's a psychopath. No metronome. <laughs> White noise machine. So Caleb turns on his TV. It's not a TV. It's a monitor to Ava's room. He changes the channel. It's another camera looking outside. He changes it again. It's another angle in Ava's room. Caleb doesn't get it. Gets out of bed. He's switching channels to different angles of Ava. She walks over to a wall, puts her hand on it, and all the lights in the place go out. Red light comes on like the one that's in on Herman's video right now. If you're watching us on YouTube in Madness Pod. And it says power cut. Full lockdown. Caleb tries to leave his room, puts his key card on, but it won't work. Full facility lockdown. The power gets restored. Caleb leaves his room. He walks down a hall with a bunch of masks on the wall. Kind of looks like Slipknot. <laughs> That's, that is definitely an unfiltered thought of yours. <laughs> <laughs> the last mask sort of looks like Ava's face. The room already is lit up blue, so Caleb enters, but it's dark. He picks up a phone and asks for his key card. The second he puts it behind him, yells, Nathan, you don't have phone access. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I was just going to say, Sean, I, I, uh, I didn't mean to cut you off, but no, go ahead. I, I, he's got that white t shirt on, so I had to look up if that meant anything that that he's wearing and it doesn't it's just a white graphic tee from the gap with a car and a road on it and it didn't have any i was wondering if there was like going to be some secret hidden in that shirt there's but. so much like hidden meaning throughout the whole movie and they're like nah just something to pick up you yeah well gap. just a white graphic tee with the gap you could have bought it it was up on prop store i missed my opportunity to buy this it. is kind of like a transition scene anyway you know yeah, that's true. And maybe he's wearing the white for that reason. Interesting. Nathan's laying there in the room, drunk, several bottles of beer around him. You do understand with Ava. I mean, you're a great guy, instant pals and so on. And he takes another swig of his beer. This dude is weird. He is shady as hell since moment one. I do not like Nathan. He asks Caleb, who are you going to call? Ghostbusters? Haven't you seen the movie? Ghosts give Dan Aykroyd oral sex. <laughs> which i think they do allude to in the second ghostbusters that that uh he did have sex with the ooze they they do but it's what what a summary of that film just yeah. that one line <laughs> i do like the way sometimes the way that nathan thinks caleb says he wants to know how the phone worked nathan asks what he's doing awake something happened in my room the power cut I left to see what's going on. Yeah, the power cuts. That's been happening recently. Uh, we're working on it. Shady, hmm. shady, shady. Caleb says he couldn't leave his room. It's a security measure, automatic lockdown, or anybody could just open the place up 
disabling the power. If it happens again, relax. Shady, shady, shady. He's just looking at Caleb like he fucking hates him. He says, sweet dreams, Caleb leaves. Nathan just stares at his ass. Not his, at his ass, but just stares at him. At, <laughs> his, literal, at his literal at his ass. literal ass. At Caleb his is woken up in the, in the morning by this sweet little thing in a white dress entering his room with a tray. Leaves food on a table in the room and leaves without saying anything or making any eye contact. And honestly, it looks like Caleb was abusing himself under the bed sheets right before she walked in. <laughs> it, it did have that vibe. I did it did. It did, because he's like, uh, uh. he's yeah. got that al alarm look about him. He looks shameful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, do, what do you have to be so shamed about? huh? Yeah, yeah, just wake up normally. Caleb gets ready. He runs up to Nathan, who's working out. He says he sent the girl, Kyoko, in there to wake him. Day two, what's the plan? Now Nathan seems briefly cool for a second. Seems enthusiastic, way different than he was acting before when he was drunk. Testing Ava through conversation is a closed loop and annoyed Nathan's like closed loop. Like testing a chess computer by only playing chess. Like McCready in The Thing. You can mm -hmm. play it to find out if it makes good moves, but that won't tell you if it knows it's playing chess. And it won't tell you if it knows what chess is. So simulation versus actual. Caleb thinks being able to differentiate between those two is the Turing test you want me to perform. Nathan wants to keep it simple. No textbook approach. He wants simple answers, simple questions. Yesterday, I asked how you felt about her. You gave me a great answer. Now the question is, how does she feel about you? That mm. manipulation again. See? He's always talking about his feelings. Always wants you to think with your feelings. Dude's a real bastard. <laughs> mm. We're about to find out. Ava session two. Ava's holding up a piece of art. Bunch of lines. Kind of looks like, what, Spirograph art? I don't know. You guys remember that shit? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course I remember Spirograph. I, and uh, we, we'll talk about AI art later on. <laughs> we'll wait. So, okay, about so how like... great it is. <laughs> oh, and the episode's over. <laughs> Thank Damn. you, everyone. Reach out to us on all the socials. We'll see you later. So is it is it AI art if it's still an AI actually making art? No, oh, yeah. well, it is art? the same thing. They just made her look like a woman. Either it's a box or it's yeah, absolutely. Okay. Here's the thing, that, but I will say, yeah, in your defense and what you just said, she's being creative. She's not filtering other people's IP to be creative. So I don't know, Sean. Maybe, <laughs> so maybe I'm. Yeah, she what has like a will and her mm. own thoughts. You know, is is an AI making art? AI art. Oh my oh, brain! Uh, yeah, is oh, it AI? Brain. Is it AI at that point? Right? There's nothing. Oh, let us know on like the this? socials. Look at how deep we get down the rabbit hole at In Madness Pod, In Madness Pod at Gmail .com. Hit us in the mail sack. Let us know what you think. Spirograph art. Asking Caleb, what does he think? He asks what it's a drawing of. She asks if he knows. He doesn't. Does she know? She says she does drawings every day, but she never knows what they are. Caleb asks if it's supposed to be something specific, like an object or a person. He tells her she should try. She agrees and asks what she should draw. He says whatever she wants. It's her decision. She asks why. He says he's interested to see what she'll draw. She asks Caleb if he wants to be her friend. Of course, he says. She asks if it'll be possible. Caleb doesn't understand. She says, our conversations are one-sided. You ask questions, study my responses. You learn about me. I learn nothing about you. That's not friendship. She wants Caleb to talk about himself. He nervously laughs, asks where you should start. It's your decision. I'm interested to see what you'll choose, she says. How the puppet has become the master. This is where mm -hmm. he gets, starts to get manipulated by her now. He tells her he's 26. He works in Nathan's company. Blue Book. Named yep. after Wittgenstein's notes. It's the world's most popular internet search engine processing an average of 94% of all internet search requests. She asks where he yep. lives. Brookhaven, Long Island. Represent. Woo-woo! There you yeah. go. 
Long uh, Island, right? You guys ever been to Brookhaven? I, I've, yeah, I've been facility out there, right? What's that, Herman? He said there's a research facility out there, right? I think that's why he's he said, really it's set there. Yeah, there's a there's a science uh, research facility out there, I believe, and that because he says that he is close walk to work. Um, hmm. So it's it's based on reality. That's a real thing out there. Damn. Long Island, you can't escape us. We are yeah. we are around you. We are amongst you. No road trip, Sean. Let's let's go. We'll take a road trip out Brooke to the Haven? science facility. We'll go to the we haven't even facility. gotten a sandwich yet. Yeah, we haven't even. <laughs> we got to go to Mission Sandwich. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. We'll bring Herman. He says he's got a small apartment in Brookhaven, Long Island. It's a five minute walk to the office, five minute walk to the ocean. She asks if he's married. If he's single, he says yes. She asks about his family. He grew up in Portland, Oregon. No siblings. Parents were high school teachers. They both died in a car crash when he was 15. He was in the car. This makes Ava sad, almost brought to artificial intelligence tears. She says she's sorry. Caleb says it's all right. He says he's going in, he got into coding and went to college and became pretty advanced. Ava says an advanced programmer like Nathan. First, he says yes. Then he says no, it's different. Nathan wrote Blue Book base code when he was 13, which if you understand code, what he did was like Mozart. She asked if he likes Mozart. He likes Depeche Mode. She asked if he likes Nathan, but Nathan is watching. Caleb hesitates, says, of course. She asks if they're friends, good friends. He says he hopes so. This is all intertwined with shots of cameras watching their conversation. He says and, the only... And, yep. Sean, it's so random to say, like, do you know Mozart? Do you like Mozart? And he just blurts out, like, I like Depeche Mode. And I have nothing against Depeche Mode at all. I've actually seen him in concert twice, I think. But, cool. But it's just a very... Uh, I don't know. It just rolled out of his mouth so so quickly that I I it threw me, and I was just like, "Is Depeche Mode his favorite band? Does he, you know, does he also, you know, like uh, uh, Knights of Reb and Front Two Four Two? And I just I got distracted by a shiny object for a second. It was just wondering and thinking maybe that's his favorite band of all time because he's comparing it to Mozart. Uh, pretty equivalent, I think. Social, <laughs> it's pretty 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 good. Both of them. This is fine. Yeah. Yeah. Music for the masses. Yeah. Uh, he says they only just met. It takes time to get to know each other. The power cuts again. Backup power activated. A voice announces and all the red lights go on, just like in Herman's room right now. If you're watching us on YouTube in Madness Pod, we see the camera shut off. Caleb gets up to push on the door. Locked. Ava rises and fucking whispers. Caleb. Oh, no, you know this can't be good. Mm -hmm. You're wrong about Nathan. He isn't your friend. You shouldn't trust him or anything he says. Oh, no, the machine knows something more than Caleb. Then the power gets restored. Cameras come back on. Ava immediately picks up the conversation. And if we make a list of book, books of works of art, which we both know, it would form the ideal basis of a discussion. Caleb sitting there stunned agrees. Mm -hmm. You knew that shit was coming. I smit the second she stopped and whispered, I was like, Fah! of course, of course. <laughs> yeah. It's a big stark change for sure. Oh, just because her whisper, just the whisper, I was like, fuck. Again with the color, and, the red, and everything. Yeah. And and they create, you know, he creates her Nathan and um gives her this sexual presence that he is, you know, he's using it to manipulate Caleb and it wouldn't have worked if it was just a, a box or if it was whatever. And she's, you know, turning the tables on them to say, if you're going to create me this way and give me this, then I'm going to use what you gave me in, in all the ways possible to manipulate you too. Um, it's it, it, it's just very interesting of who. I think the first time you see this movie and you go through it, you. I don't know. I had just assumed Nathan had it all figured out, and I was just like, okay, it's going to end very poorly for Caleb, and pro right. and probably this AI as well. Mm. Uh, and you know, you think he's in control, or he thinks he's in control, and 
you certainly done a tremendous job with that place and and all the technology but he's not in control at all and as soon as she got to this stage in her development she was in control mm. right so imagine if there was a stage after this with her right because that was his plan uh, pretty crazy but um yeah i mean listen you know most men can easily be dis- heterosexual men can be distracted by you know high heels and a short skirt so especially she, in this movie she picks it up right away and is going to use <laughs> what she needs to use to get her it's also just manipulation on the fact that she now she just learned about the fact that his family passed away basically in mm-hmm. front of him that um he learned she just learned all these like little facts about him and mm-hmm. then immediately the power shuts down and she tries to play into his empathy immediately right. she she learned that okay maybe maybe he's a you know a good guy who has a conscious and i could play into that mm. to escape so immediately she starts manipulating him too <sighs> poor caleb yeah, and she just that data just gets inputted to her right there, and then she just processes it, and and just like any other computer, and is able to use it right away. That's a great point. We cut the Caleb and Nathan having dinner. Kyoko serving him food. She spills a glass. Nathan gets pissed. Caleb's like, "It's all right." Nathan doesn't uh, says she doesn't understand English. Just give her the napkin. He does. Nathan explains like it's a firewall. He could talk about trade secrets over dinner and know that it'll go no further. It also means he can't tell her when he's pissed for being clumsy, clumsy and spilling wine all over my house guest. Annoyed, Caleb's like, I think she knows you're pissed. Nathan dismisses her. And already I kind of feel like she's a robot. I'm just saying this is just in my notes. I kind of just I can get the feeling she's a robot. Nathan says no matter how rich you get, shit goes wrong. He used to think it was death and taxes you couldn't avoid, but it's actually death and shit. <laughs> like this that. is the first time, too, where he you see him. I mean, he's a piece of shit pretty much the whole time. <laughs> but here, he again, with the reference of him being essentially God or religion, um, playing that like uh, vengeful, angry kind of role. You know, it's mm-hmm. more like Old Testament, pretty much. Um, right. Like when he gets pissed and then he he talks about how, you know, she can't even understand or understand him anyway. You know, it's kind of playing into the fact that he like he's a god um, almost speaking in, in languages that other these creatures that he creates can't even understand. And he can kind of treat them however the fuck he wants. Like he's very entitled. Yeah. And he doesn't have any other interactions. Right. So he just has the world that he created is where he interacts and only with beings that that he created that the helicopter pilot can only go so close to where they are he just knows he needs to be there at whatever time you know the following week so yeah i mean it's it probably warping enough to live in isolation let alone with beings that you created and developed and i just can't imagine we get it in the beginning right he's had the he was had a had a night of drinking. So, um, and maybe dancing. Maybe there was some dancing that night, but we'll get there. Sink dancing. It's like the yeah. power cuts. You wouldn't believe how much I spent on the generator system, but I get these failures every day. He doesn't know why they happen. The system is supposed to be bulletproof. The guys who installed it fuck something up. He can't tell them to come back because there's too much classified stuff in the house. So after the job, I just have to kill them. Great. He smiles. Caleb thinks he's joking, but is he though? Did he really? I feel like he killed these guys. Maybe. The boy yeah, that's a him. possibility. Jerry's yeah. out. Yeah, he's a rich. They can kill anybody. The boys cheers to Caleb's second day. He wants to report on Ava. Caleb says, well, you saw how the day went. You're watching us. Nathan says, yeah, but I want to hear your take on it. And you know, something shady's up. Caleb looks like he's about to spill the beans. One interesting thing happened with Ava today with a long pause. And you're like, is he about to blow up his own spot? And he goes, she made a joke and he saves himself. Nathan goes right when she threw your line back at you, right? About seeing what you'll decide. 
being interested and see what you choose. Caleb says it's the best indication of AI he's seen so far. It's complicated, non-autistic. Nathan says, what do you mean? Uh, honestly, because I don't know what the fuck Caleb is talking about either. Caleb <laughs> says she can only do that with an awareness of her own mind and also an awareness of his mind. Nathan says, oh, she's aware of you, all right. Takes a long, shady sip out of his wine glass, as if he means a lot more from that statement. Then he asks, what about the power cut? Uh-oh. Caleb plays dumb. It's the only part I couldn't see. I lost audio-visual. What happened? He looks pissed off and annoyed already. Caleb freezes. He thinks and says nothing. Nathan is doubtful as if he already knows. She said nothing. She didn't remark on it at all. The boys are just staring at each other. This creepy ambience is rising in the background. And Caleb's like, no, not really. And Nathan just goes, hmm, and guzzles down his wine. Yeah, that's a at crappy point, reply. Nothing. At this, at this part, too, it's interesting because it, it's this weird path that he gets put on. Because if he just tells him straight up what happened, you know, like the whole movie probably wouldn't really have gone down this path. And the fact that he chose to keep it a secret, you could kind of argue that she's already passing that test Mm -hmm. because he's been manipulated into knowing that he should keep a secret um, for her. Mm -hmm. So there is that weird, like uh, he's already looking at her as not just like a, an object. Yeah. uh, It's a, a thing that he should empathize with. We see Kyoko sitting in the hallway with her shoes off. Ava's resting in her chair. Caleb is watching her on a screen in his room. He looks to be almost obsessing over her. She turns and looks at the camera as if she knows he's watching, and Caleb smiles. We cut to Nathan creepily standing outside Caleb's room, leaning against the wall, because God knows how long his ass has probably just been standing there lurking like a creep. Caleb comes out surprised to see Nathan standing there. I want to see something cool, he says. And then we go down to the lab. This is where Ava was created, Nathan says. We see all these tables and molds and parts used in creation of this robot. Nathan's like, if you knew the trouble I had getting AI to read and duplicate facial expressions, you want to know how I cracked it? Caleb's like, I don't know how you did any of this. With every cell phone in America, it has a microphone, a camera, it means to transmit data. I turned on every mic across the entire planet, redirected all the data through Blue Book, and boom, limitless resource of vocal and facial interaction. Scary. So you hacked the world's phones. And he's like, yeah, all the manufacturers knew I was doing it. They couldn't accuse me without admitting it. They were doing it themselves. That's the scariest shit ever. <laughs> Correct pneumaton. Yeah, and I guess that's what we see in the beginning too. That's what they're showing us when they show the kind predator of, vision. Of, which uh Herman, your the video that you guys did for full tilt has a little bit of that in it. Yeah. It was was that a reference to this? Not a reference to this, no. Um about consciousness, though, yeah, about kind of going into your own consciousness. Mm-hmm. Um the blurring of you know you, the world that you build inside your own head versus the uh, the real world and perceptions of you type of a thing, right. but there are definitely some similar themes, um, mm-hmm. not intentionally, um, but it's actually kind of cool if we connect them. So let's say that's on purpose. Okay, <laughs> there you go. You heard it, say, here, folks. <laughs> Sean, this uh, this is the only part. This scene and a couple of things around building these robots is the part where some of the science gets a little shady mm. because usually, usually you don't get the heavy thinker guy who's also the nuts and bolts guy. Mm. So we're led to believe he built all of these robots. So he, he's really good and has this amazing manual dexterity and, and and is good with his hands, but it can also do the coding side and be this, you know, uh, different type of genius. And, and he very well could be, but, it, you know, if he's all by himself and building them and, and, and testing them, like he's got robotic arms and legs and everything else, you know, I think once you get past the brain component, which is interesting to kind of compose unto itself 
Um, I, I just wonder if anyone's helped him along the way. Does he have other machines that have helped him? And then he's those are the bodies, them? the bodies he's buried in the goddamn basement with the guys who messed up the wiring. Yeah, they help him and he kills him. That's he what doesn't I think. talk about anyone else being a part of this project ever throughout the yeah. entire movie. So, yeah, you're kind of led to believe that he's coding and physically building them on his own. Mm hmm. Or at least that's the, I mean, again, the God thing, you know, religion. I think that's intentional. Right. And it doesn't ruin the movie at all in any way. It's just when you start, when you watch this movie enough and really dive into it, like, wow, that's a, like, that's a tremendous amount. The first part's a tremendous amount of work. And then the second part, it's like, I, I just going to get parts shipped in to, via helicopter. Who's bringing them to the house and how much material does he have? And, <laughs> yeah, you know, Sean knows this. I'll go into the weird little minutia of these. Where do you get the skin? What do you mean you're out of skin? I need the skin. I'm very curious where that skin comes from. Because, like, the way that – because they, they all have, like, these, like, um, honeycomb fold. bodies. Yes. You yeah. know? Yeah. And, you know, it looks like in other parts of the movie that essentially that's how the skin gets kind of laid on them through, like, the honeycomb yes. pattern. Yeah. It's very interesting. Uh, I've never seen another movie kind of do it in that way. And the fact that I I think we said in the beginning, right, the director was also he wrote this movie. Yes. That's not true. Which is yeah. insane because uh, to direct and write something like this without it being based on like a graphic novel or something, which you see a mm -hmm. lot. Like, it's very impressive because it's a very original movie to me. Uh, you know, I'm sure it's based on other things, but it's unique. Yeah, abs absolutely. And if you've never seen Devs, his TV series, I would highly recommend Devs. Uh, it's just an amazing hard sci-fi science fiction series that will just blow your mind in, in a lot of ways. And it has also has heavy religious overtones with technology and artificial intelligence and all, all that stuff. But uh, tremendous series. I did see this. Yeah, th this was great. Yeah. Oh, Herman's watching on YouTube right now. Just I just looked over, just I, I'm looking <laughs> things up. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, I did watch this. Uh, very good. Very similar vibe, actually, now that you mention it. Now that, yeah. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. And the Herman's tragedy element to it. it with, like, one of the main characters having yeah. tragedy and that kind of playing a big role into, like, what he did. There's a I lot of mirroring. Yeah, gotta, you definitely should. Out. Especially after we, you watch this movie. It, I think you'd like it. Uh, he walks over to uh, Nathan walks through a case. He slips out this giant brain sized bean. Here we have her mind structured gel. I had to get away from circuitry. I needed something that could arrange and rearrange on a molecular level. Keep its form when it's required. Holding for memories, shifting for thoughts. Is this her hardware? And he goes wetware. He hands Caleb the brain and the software. I'm sure you can guess blue book. Caleb says it's the weird thing about search engines. It's like striking oil in a world that hadn't invented internal combustion. Too much raw material. No one knew what to do with it. My competitors were fixated on sucking it up, monetizing via shopping and social media. They thought search engines were a map of what people were thinking, but actually they were a map of how people were thinking. Impulse, response, fluid, imperfect, patterned, chaotic. Hmm. Very, very smart. And you know what's sad is when you think about it, uh, we're taught that we're we're special <laughs> and we're these individuals, and this kind of blows it out of the water because you could just get the right amount of data to input and kind of get there yep. too. So it, it it makes you feel less special because she's just picking it up right away and. You know, to be as manipulative as she is, that might take people a lifetime to sort of build up those skills and observe other people doing it. And it's just, OK, I got this. I need to get from point A to point B. I'll use this process to, to get there. And these nuances, which we all think are just human nuances, she's replicating very easily. Ava, session three. Ava's showing Caleb her picture. It's a tree, some bushes. Caleb looks less than stoked. Dude has a lot on his mind. <laughs> Says it's a nice picture. Asks if she's ever been outside the building. Of course not. She's never been outside the room she's in right now. 
Where would you go if you went outside? Maybe a busy pedestrian traffic intersection in a city, and Caleb is stunned. It's not what he was expecting. It would provide a concentrated but shifting view of human life. Caleb smiles and goes, people watching. Ava agrees. We can go together, Caleb says. It's a date. She says, there's something else I wanted to show you. She makes him close his eyes, walks into a room, goes through her closet, picks out a dress, puts it on along with some stockings, has a few wigs to pick out from. She's got pictures of models up in her room she wishes to look like. She walks out of the room, and here comes Ava. Now she's got clothes on. Now she's got hair. She looks like a real person. She approaches Caleb and tells him to open his eyes, does a little spin for him, asks him how he thinks she looks, he says she looks good. She says, this is what I'd wear on our date. Caleb says, first a traffic intersection, then maybe a show. She says, I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like us to go on a date. Are you attracted to me? And this scene, Sean, this scene is handled so beautifully. She goes back the change. It's a very slow process and we can see her. And it's interesting because Caleb is, it's like being at a zoo in a lot of ways. She's in her enclosure where she could move around and he's in this small tight box and he's kind of uh, uh, observing her and, you know, dare I say, fall, falling in love with her, um, you know, here. Uh, I have to say, too, the uh, I don't know why, but and this was 2015, so it was before that. But it has strong, like, Stranger Things vibes. I feel like they picked Eleven's out initial, the gown and her haircut and stuff off of this. It has it just seems like it. No, that that does make a lot of sense, and and also I thought it was a uh, kind of a cool artistic choice to to show her because they could have had her leave and then come back, but they showed her like picking the dress out, putting up the stockings, looking at the wig, like they went through the whole process mm -hmm. of what it took for her. Again, more it's all manipulation again, mm -hmm. you know? but I thought that was interesting one and and also uh like the through the looking glass reference because there's a lot of alice in wonderland references as well but just him the way that he fixates on looking at her through that glass is obviously a theme but th it, here is where it feels very um like important right because it's mm -hmm. the first time that she's like doing something else and he's actually looking at her through that glass um so I don't know. I think that's interesting. There's there's scenes that happen before too. Where they focus a lot on like reflections, uh, and they do that in uh, Annihilation that we talked about before. That's the one yes. thing that I think connects the two movies mm -hmm. um, quite a bit is is the um, obsession with reflection, refract, you know, light refracting, and uh, right. And she's reflecting through. back to us what it is to be a human. Mm -hmm. computer reflecting back to us of what it is to be a human and doing it better than the humans that she's around he's <laughs> easy she's read him like a book right away a few a few small facts about him and she's in complete control and then it's like he, he definitely seems lonely and that i just got to do this move and he's going to follow me with his eyes and you know, here, here we go. I'm going to get, I'm going to get what I need. Um, She's yep. doing it right now. She asked Caleb if he's attracted to her. You give me indications you are. How? Micro expressions. The way your eyes fix on my eyes and lips. The way you hold my gaze. Do you think about me when we aren't together? Now Caleb is starting to sweat. Dude is being interrogated hard. Sometimes at night I wonder if you're watching me on the cameras. Uh-oh. Busted. So creepy. <laughs> then she says, I hope you are, but now your micro expressions are telegraphing discomfort. She doesn't want to make him feel uncomfortable. Cut back to Ava in her room, removing the clothes. Cut to Caleb in his room, watching her disrobing on his television like fucking Norman Bates in Psycho. <laughs> Not a good guy right here. He's reaching out to the TV, trying to touch her. Cut to Kyoko, cutting fish in the kitchen. Nathan and Caleb are talking. Caleb asks, why did you give her sexuality? AI doesn't need gender. She could have been a gray box. No, 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 no. That's not true. Give me an example of a consciousness at any level, human or animal, that exists without a sexual dimension. 
It's not an ev it's an evolutionary reproductive need. What imperative does a gray box have to interact with another gray box? Can consciousness exist without interaction? Sexuality is fun. If you're going to exist, why not enjoy it? You want to remove the chance of her falling in love and fucking? Caleb, Caleb looks away uncomfortably. Nathan says, the answer to your real question, you bet she can fuck. Caleb uncomfortably sips his beer and says, what? And of course, Nathan goes into detail. In between her legs is an opening with a concentration of sensors. You engage them in the right way. It creates a pleasure response. So if you wanted to screw her, mechanically speaking, you could, and she'd enjoy it. So poor Caleb gets played by her. And now he's being played by Nathan because that was sort of his last bit of information. He knows he's falling for her. And then this is his last bit of information to put it over the top. And now he's, you know, you know, go back to his room <laughs> with no windows and just be thinking about that the whole, the whole night. Yeah. So. Now he knows that she is an actual sexual being, uh, being, and again, always pushing him to think with like his like raw emotions and, you know, his, his humanness instead of like his actual brain. That was an interesting transition too. It's her undressing and revealing the robotics underneath the, uh, the dress. Mm -hmm. And then the literal next cut is uh, cutting the fish, cutting flesh. Yes. It's like that transition from like hard robotics to actual physical meat. Right. It's kind of cool. Uh, yeah, it's and great. he kind of reveals that he's probably fucking these robots. So right? this is my question that I am posing to Vertebrae and Hermit. Is this what you think millionaires, billionaires, and trillionaires are doing? Just hanging out on their massive Jurassic Park properties <laughs> and having sex with robots? No. I mean, you got to have the robots. No. I mean, he made this. this these they robots. want to. and you I think, think the, these the, trillionaires the, don't have sex robots on their Jurassic Park islands. I think they are treating people like robots <laughs> that's, that's the other problem here yeah 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 it's probably cheap that's probably cheaper sean that's probably yeah. a lot human flesh yeah These yeah people. i do love when she's cutting the fish too it's this weird deliberate manner and at that point i remember when i was first watching the movie like i kind of thought oh maybe she's a robot um or maybe she's just really he's got her like he's really devious and she's drugged out a drugged out human that he sort of you know this kept person um and that was just that was just weird it was very i don't know like very kind of unrobotic too right like very soft way of doing it it was really interesting Caleb gets annoyed, but he's also intrigued. That wasn't my real question. Did you give her sexuality as a diversion tactic, like a stage magician with a hot assistant? So a hot robot who clouds your ability to judge her AI. Did you program her to flirt with me? If I did, would that be cheating? And Caleb says, yes. Nathan says, what's your type? Actually, don't answer. Let's say it's black chicks. Why is that your thing? Because you did a detailed analysis of all racial types and you cross reference that analysis with a points based system. No, you're just attracted to black chicks, a consequence of accumulated external stimuli that you probably didn't even register as they registered with you. Caleb asked, did you program her to like me or not? Nathan says he programmed her to be a heterosexual, just like you. Caleb says, no one program him to be straight. Nathan says, you decided to be straight. Please, of course, you were programmed by nature or nurture or both. And to be honest, you're starting to piss me off because this is your insecurity talking, not your intellect. Come with me. And he's playing him because he's now he's <laughs> remarking about his intellect. The whole time, he didn't want him to talk about his intellect at all. He didn't want anything to do with it. He wanted all of his emotions. Yeah. And now that he's showing so much emotion, he's he's just. He's just toying with this guy. Behind them, we get a shot of Kyoko still standing there while they're having this conversation, and she seems to be listening along. Although she's not supposed to understand English. <laughs> Nathan takes Caleb to a room, shows him his painting. You know this guy? Jackson Pollock, drip painter. He let his mind go blank, his hand where it wanted. Not deliberate, not random, someplace in between. They called it automatic art. 
Let's mm. make this like Star Trek. Engage intellect. I'm Kirk. Your head is warp drive. Engage intellect. What if Pollock had reversed the challenge? What if instead of making art without thinking, he said, you know what? I can't paint anything unless I know exactly why I'm doing it. What would have happened? And Caleb says he never would have made a single mark. Uh, except, Sean, <laughs> there's nothing automatic about what Pollock did. And saying this, this is where Nathan shows he's better with computers than, than he is art. Um, is a complete disservice to the art that Pollock made, whether you like it or not. Um, Jackson Pollock was very deliberate in what he did. There's even a video, there's a, a, a movie with Ed Harris who plays Pollock. And in that, they kind of go through his life and they film this video of him and he's going through the process of himself painting. Um, and he says in the video, and I'll, I'll just read what he says. He says, uh, a method of painting is a natural growth out of need. I want to express my feelings rather than illustrate them. I can control the flow of paint. There is no accident and no beginning and no end. And sometimes he loses a painting and he <laughs> states they have a life of their own. So there's nothing automatic about what he's doing at all in the in the painting in, in his painting process. Um, and he references this automatic painting or automatism. And that, that's a term really borrowed from psychology where it describes our bodily movements that we don't consciously control, like breathing or sleepwalking, th things like that. That's not Pollock's paintings. That's not an automatic thing that he doesn't control. He's in control of it and choosing to express his emotions by drip, dripping this paint. Um, and, and I will say the, the funny thing is I, I wrote I'd write a paper in college uh, on Pollock um, and I got downgraded on it because of a sentence I had in there and the professor took it as an insult to Pollock and I was complimenting him. And, and what I said was I thought that he enjoyed making it more than we enjoyed viewing it. And what I meant was not that it was not good art. It was that it was so into him as who he was as a human being that you can't recapture that just by looking at it um and he and he didn't get it and i tried to you know fuck that teacher some, you remember yeah, his name put that. him on blast no i tried to throw mr some silver gnarly, fuck yeah, you gnarly mr. Bits silver. At him, but he wasn't having it but it was it was really just his paintings were the process of the painting and were the emotions that he was creating by by doing that and creating this this life so this is the only part of the movie where it's like this is a good way to show nathan's arrogance and, and we see it throughout it but here's here's another one he's you know in football terms he's out kicked his coverage on art <laughs> on art theory on art theory i but, i'm a huge jackson pollock fan actually mm -hmm. as well um so it's cool to know that you wrote a paper on it and you're interested because um, I did think it was interesting that he had a Pollock there and they specifically, they, I mean, they chose Pollock for a reason. I think the, it serves the point that he's trying to make. And I think that is, you know, his entire personality is, is right. pretty much just based on using things and people the way that it serves him. So I think in that way it does work. Um, funny thing. I do like, I do remember that movie you were talking about and I think Pollock, was on set for some of that right and i heard this story yeah from, like mm -hmm. fucking hating that movie and like <laughs> yes. off and he actually <laughs> relapsed i think because of that movie he started drinking yeah. again um but yeah what you said about pollock I'm, i could we could do a whole uh podcast about pollock honestly i'm very right. interested but yeah the 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 art being about the process and not necessarily the finished result like a uh, native american sand art or something like that um mm -hmm about the the experience of the expression and not necessarily what it looks like in the end um, right so the quote that uh the part of your essay that you said that your teacher didn't like i actually think it's very accurate for oh Bob. thank you i appreciate yeah. it so you get but, uh, it for me <laughs> yeah <laughs> so the painting is jackson pollock's number five ironically enough it sold for 140 million dollars and the budget of this movie was $15 million. So we'll just, we'll just put that in as a comparison. It's fucking crazy. Um, yeah, crazy. So, That's and we get another right. painting. 
What'd you say, Herman? So that's why he drank. <laughs> it was about <laughs> the expression of his feelings and the process of expressing those things. And then it gets turned into millions of dollars. Like it's kind of just what, you know, Basquiat was like that too, where he kind of fucking hated that aspect of it, you know? Yeah. And it was, I think it was David Geffen who owned it and then sold it in like a private auction and, and just got that astronomical amount of money. You see what you did, Sean? You put two art nerds on the same podcast. This is I was <laughs> just going to say this is becoming one of our most, again, educational episodes of In Madness Pod, and I'm very stoked <laughs> about it. Awesome. I'm glad. I, like I said, I could talk about this stuff for for days. I, I, I personally like that process aspects of creating art, and I used to do this thing where I'd you know, not not like in art school where you have to like, don't let the pen go off the paper and just keep moving. But the concept of just kind of con consistently adding to something without thinking about what it's going to be, just like it mm -hmm. kind of takes shape on its own. Um, I do right. that a lot when I write lyrics, too. I'll, I'll draw something in that way. And a lot of times they end up being like just patterns or like deformed faces with like, you know, 3D and 2D elements kind of mishmashed all together. And then after I do that, it's easier for like words to kind of flow out of me. Cool. I'm in that same space where it's not about writing something that like, oh, all right, I'm trying to write a story and it has to have this this beginning and end and needs to be linear. You know, sometimes it's it's cool to be like Pollock when you're writing lyrics where it's just stuff. You know, you don't even have to yeah. use it it's not even about that. You can use a one-off word or a phrase you wrote and not use the rest of it. It's whatever, you know, I, I really, really resonate with that. So do you have any of those sketches? Yeah, I have time. Yeah, dude, I have send, send me some and we'll post here. them on the, on the in madness social. Oh, nice. Yeah. I got, yeah. I have a ton of shit. I could, I can send you for sure. And, and I'm totally jealous about being able to create by just creating, <laughs> because even if I get a sketchbook, um intimidated by it because it, you know you buy like a nice sketchbook and the and i would rip pages out and cut them out and i you know sort of freelance for so long that it's hard for me sometimes to create something that doesn't have the next purpose to it right so i have you know i have my own merch line and stuff and and my art is being used for those shirts so it has a purpose and i'm super jealous of other artists that i interact with who can just create things and be okay with it being, you know, just the process and just doing it. It doesn't have to land somewhere. And, and that's I, why I love it, Pollock. Yeah. I think I used to make art a long time ago that never landed anywhere. Then I started making it that landed somewhere. And then I could never also flip side, create things just to, to create them. And, you know, it's just a, a weird brain thing that I'm not able to do. And, and I wish I could, but I think it's incredible. I would love to see like sketches that went along with lyrics or helped you build that process of writing. That's, that's pretty cool. For sure. Yeah. I'll send you guys some stuff. It's definitely Badass. Yeah. We'll post that at in madness pod on the socials. Nathan is stoked to hear Caleb's answer. Yes. There's my guy. There's my buddy who thinks before he opens his mouth. The challenge is not to act automatically is to find an action that is not automatic from painting to breathing, to talking, to fucking, to falling in love. For the record, Ava isn't pretending to like you, and her flirting isn't an algorithm to fake you out. You're the first man she's seen that isn't me, and I'm like her dad. Can you blame her for getting a crush on you? No, you can't. And he stares at Caleb menacingly as tense music begins to rise. Which brings us to Ava, session four. Yeah, that's also the the a big turning point in the movie because there's that. Uh, <laughs> well, which is that exactly why this is where we're going to pick up <laughs> next week oh. on our th new thrilling episode of In Madness Pod, episode twenty, part two, <laughs> featuring our good buddy Andrew Herman from Johnny Booth, Long Island Zone, new album moments elsewhere out now. Tour just announced. Check it out on the socials. Plug the socials for yourself and the band. Yeah, we got we got all the socials. We're we're on the YouTube's, we're on the Instagrams, uh, Facebook. Um, yeah, hit us up on uh, Johnny Booth, New York, on any social media platform. 
um, you hit us up, it's it, it's it's us. So um, we will give you a personal response. How you guys feeling about uh, part one of this episode of X? <laughs> uh, it's a heavy, lot of fun. Heavy. It's a lot of fun. The betrayals, the lies, the plans, <laughs> the plotting. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. great. I mean, this movie, it's funny because when I made all the suggestions, um, I i honestly didn't think this was the one movie where I'm like, they're not going to pick this because it's really not horror. I thought you oh. guys may have went for like uh, the house that Jack built over this oh. one. But um, when you said it, I was like, oh, sick, because it's not a horror movie. It's like a sci-fi thriller but it is the ending is creepy as fuck so we're also in the process of transitioning we're not so much i guess horror i guess where it's genre and and you know darker dark sci-fi because thriller thriller thriller, thriller can be horror could be sci-fi can kind of be anything that kind of opens you up because it is adjacent and i don't think that's like outside of the you know outside of the realm well, we'll blow it all out of the water with our next episode. Show Boom. Thank music. you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Herman, for being here for part one. This wraps up episode 20, part one of In Madness Pod Ex Machina. We will see you next week for In Madness Monday.